This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Come shopping at Central Milton Keynes. Just a stone's throw away from London stands the weirdest town in Britain. This place had good intentions, it had grand ambitions of becoming some kind of utopian city in Britain. Not surprisingly, the plan has come in for a good deal of criticism. And the Ministry of Housing official who was sent down here to investigate complaints himself said that he personally had doubts about the wisdom of building on as large a scale as this. The Milton Keynes has the feel of a cross between a centre parks and a Category B prison. The idea of this video is to interview the citizens of this place, but there is literally no one here. During World War II, the country was bombed to shit. And at the time, a lot of people were living in these very big cities like London, where everything was built on top of each other very closely. The houses were in close proximity to one another. You could hear your neighbor farting through the wall. Sorry. In 1946, the New Towns Act was passed. 15 new towns are being built in Britain. New homes for 700,000 people. Over the next 20 to 30 years, the UK turned into a game of Sim City, and 32 completely new towns were built from scratch. The success of these new towns are a mixed bag, shall we say. Most recent addition to Hemel Hempstead New Town are these delightful water gardens, built to soothe the eye as only water can. What dreams a fountain can inspire, but then what dreams these clean and spacious surroundings have already answered. People just look sad in Hemel now. I just don't think there's enough life here. But out of all these new towns, there was one that was supposed to be different. One that was supposed to be a utopia. This is Milton Keynes. As you can see, it looks weird. There's literally no one here. If you look at that, I mean, it's ugly. It's ugly as fuck. So you saw this one that didn't work, and they went, no, no, we won't go for that. No one likes that. So what did they come up with? Let's just think, what color, you know, new colors, new bricks, new stuff. This. Me. Milton Keynes is a tiny village in the heart of North Buckinghamshire. At the moment, about 200 people live here, and it's basically a farming community. But it's not going to stay that way for very much longer. I think it's ridiculous. Well, personally, I'm very disappointed, upset, really. Do you think it'll change the identity of the village at all? Yes, I do. How? Well, being Londoners down here, we, we just don't like them. We're country bred and born, and we like the country as it is. There was a geezer by the name of Jock Campbell. Now, he was an aristocrat, so I suppose the word geezer probably doesn't describe him accurately. And he felt a little bit awkward from having inherited a lot of his wealth from slavery. And so this kind of affected him massively, and it turned him into a very big socialist. In 1967, he was brought on to be the chairman of the Milton Keynes Development Corporation. And our boy, Lord Campbell of Eskrun, yeah, he had all these beliefs about equality and egalitarian societies. He wanted to make a fairer, newer world. Uh, they appointed Lord Campbell of Eskrun, a socialist peer, been to Eton, and so he was kind of a, a very idealistic Kind of person. But it's going to take between 15 and 20 years to build up to a population of a quarter of a million, which incidentally is the biggest new town or new city uh, previously planned in the Western world. Milton Keynes had a very clear vision of the kind of place that it wanted to be. It was the biggest of any of the new towns in Britain, in, and one could argue in retrospect probably the boldest in terms of the way that it set about doing things. So by now it's the 70s and everyone has a Ford Cortina, they're whipping around, driving to McDonald's drive throughs We're in the future now. And so Milton Keynes was built in this time of like car euphoria, where we all thought that the car was the best thing ever. What could go wrong? And so Milton Keynes adopted the grid system. Now the grid system did not exist in England. It was the most un-English looking thing on earth. Straight, robotic, endless roads that siphon cars quickly to their destination. And obviously we had to throw our little English twist on it. So we gave it the roundabout. But really this was a very American thing and it was weird. 
in a way, it is sort of genius because it meant cars were very much separated from humans. Your kids could run outside and not get plowed down by a van. And it meant you could get everywhere you wanted to very fast and most importantly, very efficiently. You've arrived at your destination. Before we go any further, I want to give a massive thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. If you want an amazing, high quality, professional website that's easy for you to make yourself with tons of templates to choose from, you can just pick one that you like and customize it exactly to fit what it is you do. Whatever it is you do, you might run a little clothing brand, you might be a PT, or you have a little cupcake company. Squarespace has you covered. And as well, there's a bunch of built in tools that you can add to your website just to take it to that next level. If it's appointment scheduling, members only content, email marketing, it's all very easy to do and it's actually enjoyable. I've used Squarespace myself and I genuinely find it fun. It's cost effective. They look amazing. So I'd massively recommend them. So be sure to check out squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. Before we can really talk more about Milton Keynes specifically, I have to give you more context to some stuff that is important. I promise you. And that is some weird shit that was going on in the world of architecture in the early 1900s. Modernism. A gentleman by the name of Louis Sullivan, he coined the term form follows function. Now what that means is that he believed that beauty comes from things that have a purpose, like the sun. It gets up in the morning, he does his thing and goes to sleep at night for a reason. And when we look at it and we go, God, that's beautiful. The reason we think it's beautiful is because there's a reason for it or some shit. To me, it just seems overly complicated. To give him credit, Louis seems like he was a pretty chill bro. Some of his buildings were nice, but then these absolute crackheads emerged from their dungeons and just completely radicalized the entire architectural industry. You had a freak called Adolf Loos. Obviously, he was called Adolf. Why wouldn't he be? Art Nouveau was really popular in Adolf Loos's time, and he looked at that and thought, you know what, lads, I think this is how everything should be built. He did this speech called Ornament and Crime. I recommend you read this because it is insane and is partly why all of our buildings look the way they do these days. Effectively, he was making the claim that ornamentation was crime because it took man hours and the people making it didn't have the money that the people who owned the buildings did. And basically to make it fair, everything should look ugly and shit and no one should be able to enjoy beautiful things. But I'm not done. I'm not finished. There is one other crazy son of a bitch, and his name was Le Corbusier. It seems as though he took the modernist attitude and then applied it to entire city planning. I'll give you an example of one of his most controversial ideas, and that was the city of Paris. Famously, beautiful architecture, loved and visited by people all around the world. He suggested that they should flatten Paris and replace it with this. Anyway, that brings me back to Milton Keynes. Richard Lewin Davis and partners were tasked with the job of building Milton Keynes, designing it. And there's a quote in a book from 1985 called Richard Lewin Davis and the Architect's Dilemma that tells us that he was a big fan of the modernist movement and that he was very critical of ornamental architects. He even considered Bauhaus, which looks like this, as being too flashy and having too much ornamentation. So great. This is the guy building the city for people to live for generations. You can directly see Le Corbusier's influence in Milton Keynes in a church called Lady Lourdes. And yes, this is a church, although nothing about it would tell you it's a church. And you can see Le Corbusier's direct influence with his building, Villa Savoyer. So like, I've been making this video on Milton Keynes for a few pr few months, and so it's been on my mind. Every time I drive around, I'm looking around, I see places, and I'm like, it's so ugly. And you come somewhere like here, you're just like, how do, why do we not do this? Like, why is this not the standard? A home of your own in Milton Keynes. It's a mass production housing job by a prestige firm of architects, Foster Associates. And from the outside, I don't like it much. Netherfield too has that uniformity which most people find hard to take about modern architecture. 
In Milton Keynes, when you look at the buildings, it looks like something you could have whipped up in Minecraft in two minutes. The court is ugly as fuck. The library, which was apparently some incredible piece of architecture at the time, it looks like it belongs in Gary's mod. Now then, a new entertainment complex called The Point has recently opened at Milton Keynes. This was like game changing in the past, in like the 80s, and when it was released, this was like state of the art. A seven and a half million pound leisure palace. And it kind of captured the spirit of the place because it was a first in the UK, it was very different, very modern. And then now, it's nothing. It's abandoned, the company went under, it just sits there as a remnant of this era, sort of reminder of sort of failed ideas in a way. The escape looks like a warehouse. Who, who came up with that and went, you know what? That's what we need, a big old fucking metal tube. And then you have the actual warehouses, which you will see just about everywhere. They have this sort of like omnipotent, ever watching presence as you drive around. They're awful buildings. We're in a town called Buxton. Obviously you can see all the amazing looking buildings, blah, 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 you get it, it's beautiful. The thing I've noticed is a very small intricate detail. It's things like this, even, even things like this. In Milton Keynes, it's just a pole. It just seems that because Milton Keynes was built in this time when modernism was the be-all and end-all of architecture, which, to be honest, it kind of still is, unfortunately, they seem like they've got their hands tied where this is the look of the city and no one wants to try and break the mold and do something different. To me, it's just cringy. It's kind of, it's like as if you dressed as an emo when you were 12 and you still dress like it now. It's ironic because it's meant to be the city of the future. But it looks like the city of the future as imagined in the 70s. But there's just so many vacant and derelict buildings in the middle of Milton Keynes. They've had to demolish a load of them and it just shows that this is an architecture that's built to last. Let's start by seeing how our town looked 150 years ago. Industry moved into the town, it needed workers. What could you expect with drab looking houses and ugly factories? Not even uh, a there are interesting questions though, if you're thinking about new development, I think, which is, are you losing something from what you get in those older cities? What, is the, what are the lessons? Sometimes the lessons that have been taken, if you like, are rather paradoxical, uh, because actually it turns out that people quite like living uh, close to each other. It turns out that people actually have begun to move back into the urban areas that previously everybody said they wanted to move out of. A game, a shop, a lolly. I wish I lived here. Well, for sure, old towns have a problem of overcrowding. Especially since everywhere is now built to accommodate the car. You get traffic, pollution, no green space. Yeah, there are loads of criticisms you can make about old towns. But what Milton Keynes did was throw away literally everything that was good about traditional towns. And they went down the route of community without propinquity. Within the, within the new town itself, there's constantly been a series of debates around what sort of community you can construct. How do you, com how do you construct communities? How do you make communities where people live together, work together, um, and uh, define themselves? So this was an idea popularized by a guy called Melvin M. Webber. He's an American. And he believed that because now we're all futuristic Freddies and we have cars, then your local community, like the people who live near you, your local butchers, all the blah, 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 blah. Fuck them. You have a car. Now I can go drive far away from them pricks and see people I actually like. And so this really led to the very car-centered focus on cities like Milton Keynes and many others. However, I believe it has led to a very unintended consequence specifically in Milton Keynes, and that is atomization. So weird, you never see anyone anywhere. Everywhere you go is this, like maybe one. I'm in, I'm in dead center right now. This is a sunny day. This is as good as Milton Keynes can look. There's just no humans anywhere. It's, it's lifeless. There is no humans, therefore there's no life. Milton Keynes is just so fucking efficient that you literally don't see people walking anywhere, ever. And that's because why would you walk when it's so much more convenient to drive? And so if for whatever reason you did decide to walk, it really creates this strange feeling where you don't see any humans, but you feel like there are people around you because you can see tinted windows of cars driving past you. So you know there's life, but it's just disconnected from you. 
one of the things Milton Keynes has is just endless roads. It's roads and roundabouts everywhere. And it's really efficient. You know, you can get where you want to in five, 10 minutes really easily. You don't have to walk past another human if you don't want to. You can live in your little drone box, wake up, drive to your job, drive to fucking Tesco's and then drive home. That's all they want you to do. And it's just morbid. It ruins all the spontaneity of life, like going to that random little hipster coffee shop that you've never been to before, or bumping into someone that you know or recognize. That doesn't happen in Milton Keynes, and that's by design. It's quite new. New grid new. system. Yeah. Lots of concrete. Uh... It felt like Disneyland, but not in a good way. Like a pretend place in a real place. Yeah. I felt that because I had lived in London and Oxford, that it was a complete cultural desert just found it uh, a sort of soulless grid, just full of cars. This is really one of my biggest gripes, is soullessness. This is the thing everyone says about Milton Keynes. And I think to me, what I've noticed going to many different old towns, etc., is that there is a spontaneity of life that only exists when you aren't so efficient. So this is another place, this is Bakewell. This is the home of the Bakewell Tarp. It's a beautiful thing. This area has no cars, and it's all just little independent places, like they sell fudge. The fudge is made here. These are the little things where it kind of makes an area cultural and it's like people want to come here, right? So when you go to Milton Keynes, no one wants to go to any part of it. You go there because you have to. You like need your shampoo from Boots, so you go there. But when you live in Milton Keynes, you forget that this is how like towns are supposed to be. Towns are supposed to be like this, that you want to spend time in there and enjoy yourself. The city center of Milton Keynes is literally a privatized shopping center that closes at 8 p.m. And the only shops that are in there are big chains that exist literally fucking everywhere. The whole place is just so lifeless and purely corporate. Especially in the winter, when the weather's not so nice, and you come out of there and you've been working and there's nowhere to go. That's when you realize how bad it is because it, it is purely and simply is a shopping center. It's not the city center. And look, I'm gonna be very balanced here. My main problem with Milton Keynes is the center. There are some ideas around Milton Keynes that have really worked very well and that are really cool. As part of the more egalitarian focus on creating a city, they wanted it that people from all different economic, racial backgrounds, etc., that they would be able to have a good sized house that was close to green space. And so like five minutes from anywhere, you can pretty much get in a park in the middle of nature or be by a lake and it is lovely. I absolutely love that. The other thing that is really nice about Milton Keynes is that the surrounding towns are like like oldie worldy towns. And I don't know how Milton Keynes managed to convince them to take the Milton Keynes postcode and call themselves Milton Keynes. But in Seoul, these places are not Milton Keynes. They, they have far more history and heritage. And to give it complete credit, the architecture back in the early days probably was novel. But when you jump forward 50 or so years to 2024, Shopping centers and big brands are available everywhere. It was probably novel when it first opened. The center of Milton Keynes is pretty corporate. You're gonna find all the big brands here. And if I have a moan about the place, it's like, it's quite hard to find a restaurant that's not part of a chain. What we had to do at the Development Corporation, I was there then, is we had to switch um, almost overnight from being a, a wonderful exhibition of what small s socialistic planning can achieve in the modern age. Uh, we had to convert overnight to being a shining example of private enterprise and private investment. In 79, when Margaret Thatcher came in, despite Milton Keynes being completely funded by government money, it was now just sold to the highest bidder. So obviously all the corporates swoop in and take all the places. So we kind of just got the worst of both ideologies, like a socialist dystopia mixed with a corporatist dystopia. So all of this combined with the fact that England is cold half of the year, so the fact that there's loads of green space is only really that good when it's warm. The whole city just feels dystopic. Like, yeah, so this is modern. This isn't old and shitty and decrepit. This is fairly recent. Look at this. It's so miserable. It I feel sad just being here. However, I can rant all I want about City, but financially, Milton Keynes is a massive success. It's like the fifth most expensive place to live in the UK. A lot of that has to do with its location. It's like 
pretty much perfectly equidistant from London, Birmingham, Leicester, Oxford, and Cambridge. It's a city of corporatism. So, you know, there are great paying jobs here and it has great travel links. So when you're starved of culture, you can get far, far away on the train. But despite this, Milton Keynes has its inequality problems. For a while in 2017, it was referred to as Tent City. It was reported as having one of the highest homeless rates in the country. And genuinely, for a while, all of the underpasses were just lined with tents. Fortunately for everyone, they have cleaned this up now, but it definitely added to the overall kind of dystopian feeling that Milton Keynes gives off. And I tried to contact the council making this video and ask them some questions. They didn't reply, but I just get the impression that there is like a strange bureaucracy around Milton Keynes. This is a thing you always see with modernist architecture. Is it just has, it's like a middle finger to like a landscape. Like, look at this, look how big it is. And it just grabs all your attention. It's not subtle, it doesn't blend in with anything. So I want to summarize with why I care about this topic. And my boy, Crazy Steves, who's out now, you can go and get one of these limited time, one month, baby, pick him up. Give it to your friends, your family. Anyway, the reason me and Steves care about this topic is because we have noticed that there has been a general trend in England of our cities just looking shitter and shitter. There was a very popular bald and bankrupt video where he went around some of the shitty towns in England. And to me, Milton Keynes acts as like a warning sign for what cities could become like if the only thing that we value as society is optimizing for efficiency and profit. We need big businesses, for sure. We need these things, but there are things that have longer value, such as culture, architecture, vibrant communities. Those are the things that really make a place feel home. On the list of things that make cities beautiful and vibrant, the amount of Primarchs there are doesn't really rank very highly. But yeah, man, I just want Milton Keynes to actually be the city of the future. Try different things, but we'll see what happens. I'm really curious to hear about your cities and where you're from, your stories of Milton Keynes, so let me know in the comments. We'll continue the conversation over on Discord, so check that out. Pick up your crazy Steves now, links in the description. Peace.